Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Pure Presence book study. We're looking at the book. As most of you know, you are the happiness you seek. And my name is Bill Free. I'm happy to be back. I've been gone for two weeks. And I want to give a, a shout out special thanks to Jenny Beal and Jody. And uh, thank you for your, uh, I, I forget how to say your last name, so I'm going to leave that off. Uh, Jenny, and I want to say, thank uh, Susan Telford and Arthur for last week for uh, covering chapter six and seven. And I watched both of those book studies. They were awesome. And I really appreciate you all just keeping the flow going while I was uh, suffering down in Florida at the beach <laughs> with two of my children and uh, grandchildren, my wife, Lisa, and we had a really great time down there. And it's great to be back. And this week, we're uh, blessed to be uh, co-hosting with Joel Drasner. Hello, Joel. Hello, Hello everybody. I good feel to equally see you. blessed uh, to be back with you all. Good thank you. you. Thank you, Joel. It's good to have you back. And for most of you uh, that were any, any of you that were with us for the Being Myself book study, you would remember Joel was a co a co host uh, for us then. And I, I want to thank you, Joel, for being a co host again for this book study. And this week we're looking at chapter eight, the open empty aware space. And this is, I, I mean, I just, uh, when I read these titles, when I, when I read, like when I read this title and, and I'm, I'm looking at what is uh, highlighted, what's, what's of the most interest to me. I, I just love how Rupert just pulls these, these titles out of, you know, out of his understanding and then is able to go into the content of that description. And Joel, I, I look forward to hearing what you uh, would share about this, uh, this chapter and this opening uh, page. What, what do you, what do you say about this opening chapter, chapter eight? Sure. I'm, I'm glad you, um, mentioned about titles. And, and by the way, if I'm making weird faces at the camera, it's because I have my text and notes on screen for my eyesight. So um, I'm, I'm faking like I'm looking at you all, but I'm also looking at the text. Um, one thing that I, I was recalling as I was re reading over this chapter was something you said, Bill, in the very first um, installment. You talked about the title of the book itself and you reminded us um, of this insight that the title, the you, the first part of the title, you awareness are the happiness that the illusory you, the seeker imagines you need to seek, but actually already are. And I think it's, it's really great at the start of each chapter to kind of reconfirm that, or at least yeah. it's helpful for me in, in this yeah. one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and so what stood out was right from the very beginning. I mean, it would be hard to pick any page where every little block of text wasn't something worth highlighting, talking about. But the very first line under the question, in the first question, he says, the recognition of awareness in the background of experience is, in most cases, a necessary first step. And what hit me about that this time was, you know, there's a lot of, modalities and meditation practices and stuff where they just kind of stop with you being the witness to your experience and not being your experience. And if that's as far as it goes, that, that's fine, not casting any, any um, negative feelings towards that. But we could see that that's only a provisional or incomplete practice to just see yourself as the witness of your experience. And, and here he's, he's pointing out again that this is a necessary first step. However, it's important to understand that this presence of awareness is not just limited to the background of experience. It's also the medium within which every aspect of your experience arises. 
Yeah, I um, I couldn't agree more. I I think that uh, I want to I want to go back to what you mentioned uh, the very start when you first first started talking that um, when when you said that when we go back to the you the, the awareness you awareness are the happiness that you seek. I want to pause there and everyone check in with that awareness. Everyone check in with awareness that's in the background of this experience. It's untouched by this experience. It's, it's, it's on. And in fact, this experience only happens in awareness. And, and when, we, when we pause and check in with it, that's just relaxing into our most intimate and essential self. And I don't want to, I mean, I try to start, Joel and I, when we, in the green room, before we came on live, he was telling me about this great experiment that he's working on with about 10 people. And um, they're meeting every day to check in to, to, you know, to check into this sweet spot of awareness, this sweet spot of presence, of beingness, a as an experiment every day for 30 days to, to, to just to, to see if there's, a, uh, if there's an expanded ex uh, transformation that occurs from that. Um, experiment. I think that's a great experiment, Joel. I want to th thank you for sharing that with me. I, I find that that becomes a, a, a new default for us. And that's what the love for truth does. The love for truth would have you and uh, nine other people meet and, and just drop into this relaxed presence of awareness, the beingness that that Rupert so beautifully points to and describes and, and brings to our direct experience, even while we're having this book study. And uh, I want to uh, thank you for that, uh, giving me that. And, and I think even the statement that I just made about it, um, we'll, we'll put Joel's email in the chat. And if you want to contact him and, and join that group, that would be cool. You're, he's on day six. And I hope I didn't uh, blow, don't blow your email account by by that. But that's uh, I think that's a cool thing to do. And and a lot of us find that that practices like that. That's an inspired. I think that's an inspired idea that people would immerse into that um, direct experience as a new habit, a new default. And uh, I'm going to go back to the question that's at the top of the page that you uh, were talking about, because we didn't read the question. Is it enough to recognize oneself as the witnessing presence of awareness in the background of experience? Is it enough to recognize oneself? And that's where uh, then you started uh, uh, sharing what Rupert said, that that's a necessary first step. Yeah. Yes. What's the second step? Well, he's saying right after that, it's to understand that it's not just in the background, but it's the very medium or field or stuff of which all experience arises from in which it exists and when it's finished existing dissolving back into yeah yeah and so for me this idea that, that step two uh as a as a carpenter i like to work around the house a lot uh as a you know i was i was a builder for 35 years a home builder for 35 years and so I like to do a lot of things with my hands. And I, I notice that when I hurt myself or when there's a pain or sensation used to be, it would just be, oh, damn, that hurts. But now 
I use any kind of sensation, any kind of physical pain or things that are symptomatic or chronic. I use those as signals to pause as awareness and, and, and just see if I can use that as a place just to be aware without labeling, just to be aware without judging, to be aware. And, and that's another, like another step of relaxing into the, into what never changes and what's always the same. Lovely. Yeah. It says um, in the, in the second paragraph, Joel, it, it says it is obvious that even from a conventional point of view that thoughts and feelings arise and exist within awareness. It is not so obvious that our experience of the body and the world, which is known only as a flow of sensations and perceptions, also takes place in awareness. Yeah. I, I, as I, I said, I could easily highlight every paragraph, but I did highlight that one as well. And, and those two sentences, both to me, they, they both contain two distinct and important points. So if you, if you just take the first sentence alone, it's obvious, even from a conventional point of view, that thoughts and feelings arise and exist within awareness. Okay, so th there's a descriptive quality that, to that sentence, but there's also something that struck me very deeply this time. It's, and it's worth, I think, worth pausing to consider. No matter how vivid your thoughts and feelings are, even the worst degree of sadness, even worse may not be a great word to use, but even the most intense degree of sadness is just an arising appearance and temporary existence within awareness. The, so the, the, the temporal nature of thoughts and feelings, it, it's so profound to, to realize that, how you could never be your thought or your feeling because it's that which comes and goes while awareness is the ever um, arena or field within which it exists. And, and, and so when, whenever it's possible to pause and, and reaffirm that, I, I think it's valuable to do so. So then the second sentence that you said, he's adding this uh, astonishing revelation, so to speak, or the, it's like tearing down the wall of this belief that runs so much of us with, with, a, with a very um, almost now obvious seemingly um, explanation that, that our experience of the body, which is actually known to us as a flow of sensations and perceptions, is also just something that appears in awareness. We don't appear in this body, that body appears in awareness. Yeah, the, the, I like to go back to, <laughs> you know, you are the happiness you seek, that you, it's not the body per, it's not the body suit, it's not the person, <clears throat> The you is, it, is God. It, it's, it's awareness. It's, it's I am, the same I am that uh, gave instructions for Moses that he misappropriated as something separate from himself. He, he took that as a separate thing, entity. And that you is is what God is, and I. That's pretty exciting, and and also relieving. Like there's there's not some entity out there that's pulling levers on everyone. So it says uh, in the last paragraph on this page, and for for those that are on, I, I'm not sure where it is in Kindle, but it's on page 65 in this book. It, Rupert says, as such, the relationship between awareness and experience is much more intimate than that of an impartial witness to the objects of experience. At this stage of understanding, awareness could be likened to a vast, empty, aware space 
within which the objects of experience arise, in which they exist while they are present, and into which they vanish when they disappear. And uh, that's, that's profound because it, it, it means that what you are, what I am is, what awareness is essentially, is the unchanging, open, empty, aware space that this chapter is titled. Yeah. And if it's all right, I'd like to just go back just to the paragraph right before that as well, because, because that paragraph <clears throat> cleverly sets up what he's going to answer in the next question to come. Okay. He's, in the way I see it, he, he's talking about if our attention travels from a thought to a sensation, the tingle, like we have a sensation from, we go from a thought to the tingle of our hands or feet. And then from the sensations to perception, like a sound in our environment. The attention that we pay to each of these elements of our experience, thought, sensation, perception, never leaves this open, empty field. It, do, it doesn't go from one field through a hardened border into another field. No matter what we direct our attention to, we're just directing attention within the same singular limitless field. And, and that's going to set the stage for um, the question coming up next about um, confines of the body. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's move to that, uh, to that next question, unless you have something before that. Um, I probably could, but um, I, I'm ready to move with you. Okay. So the next question on page 66, second, after the second paragraph, the questioner comes back and says, but my awareness seems to be confined and limited to my body. <laughs> this is the, you know, the, I, this is everyone's, this is most of us. You know, we're so fixed on this being me and and looking in the mirror and that being me. And it really takes understanding for the mind that thought it was a separate self to accept that and to fall under its uh, or into its um, understanding. And uh, I would even say uh, leader leadership. The, the leadership of, of awareness. Awareness leads the way in all of our experiences. And this, uh, this understanding relieves the mind from, from the obstacles that keep us from seeing. And then when the understanding uh, is, is firm, is established, it becomes a lived experience. Yeah. So this questioner is uh, speaking for a lot of us when, when we first start looking at these ideas. And Rupert answers that question with, allow your attention to range freely over the entire spectrum of your experience. And you can do this right now. If you're, if you're following this, this is a this is a uh, uh, this is a an answer to that issue. Just allow yourself to range freely over the entire spectrum of your experience, even right now, and see if you ever encounter anything that takes place outside awareness. Would it be possible to have an experience that occurred outside awareness? <laughs> yeah. anybody have a hand up that's having that that has an experience outside of awareness Every, everyone here if you if you've tracked that you you came to the same conclusion see that your attention never leaves the field of awareness whatever it encounters is encountered within awareness indeed Attention itself is the focusing of awareness 
within itself. Yeah, it, it's almost diabolically clever <laughs> of, a, of a, a, a point because it, it's leading to, oh, if I have a concept within awareness that my awareness is confined to my body, my awareness of that concept <laughs> is only <laughs> within itself, within awareness. Yeah. 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 I, I think the questions, I think the questions are good because, uh, and I didn't always think this way. I used to think that questions were, you know, the ego is busy, is, a, is really a busy, busy thing. And that's often true, but uh, when, the, when the questions are, are satisfactorily answered, there's no question. The questions die of n neglect. They die of because there's nothing to hang on to. So if you're a if you're you know a lot of smart, really intellectual, very academic people, they busy minds. They seem to have really good questions. Lots of them, and even them, even they 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 die. They die away. And you're left with the awareness of experience. And, <laughs> and, and then the mind just sort of quietly and gently, um, it, it dissolves into that space that knows it's, it's one with that, that awareness. It, it's the oneness of, of our being that's, that's then realized. And I guess you could call that self-realized. We also have to take into account, into account Rupert's artistry and possibly uh, back engineering the questions to spotlight exactly the clear answer he wanted to create for the reader. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he, he wrote these books, Being Myself and You Are the Happiness We Seek uh, it, it, during COVID. And so he had plenty of time he couldn't, he wasn't traveling. He get, had plenty of time to sit down and really contemplate these ideas. And that's why I think, you know, out of all the books we've looked at, this might be the most simple and, and also the most profound, mm. the most, it's the easiest to, to read and connect with. And when I give this book to, to people, they Im immediately uh, feel like they know, they know something, something is been shared with them that they didn't know before mm. yeah he says in the uh, second to the last paragraph notice that we are not speculating about an altered expanded mystical or enlightened state of awareness i, I like that because he's not talking about um you know like like uh, a channel that, that, that goes into like, uh, remember Ramtha and, and even, uh, you know, well-known other channels. This is just a natural state. This is the most natural thing that everyone has access to. And no one doesn't have access to what he is describing. And, and this is very relieving to all of us, because you, you don't have to be special to make a connection with what he's pointing to. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's another rephrasing of the, of the title. You are, you awareness are the happiness you've been seeking. It's not a, it's not a progression to something. It's not a path to something. It, it's even direct path is almost an oxymoron. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it's, just, it's it's just a, it's just a hello i'm here yes yes he says above all we are not speculating about how awareness might become if we practice hard enough or meditate long enough frank there you go keep your uh your mute your mute was uh open um 
So, uh, Joel, anything else on page 66 we want to look at? Um, yeah, in, in the last paragraph, um, now see if you can find an edge or limit to the field awareness within which your experience arises. We find a limit to everything we know or perceive, but do we find a limit to the field in which that limited experience arises? And if we do not find any such edge or limit, what legitimacy is there to our belief that it is limited? So awareness is boundless. And we can see through our exploration here that it, directly that it is boundless. So for what reason do we still want to con continue to cling to the belief that it's limited? So we can just kind of rest in that um, statement that, that this awareness is, is the unlimited self, the happiness, the, 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 the thing that you, you were always seeking, that, that I was always seeking. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be found, actually. The, the search is over. Yeah. There's no longer something to search for if you are that which you were looking for. And uh, I like this uh, next paragraph on page 67. At the very last sentence in, in, in that paragraph, we can go back and read it if, if you want, but the last sentence says, your body is an appearance in awareness. Awareness doesn't appear in your body. So your, your body suit with your name, it seemed to have a, a gender. That body suit, that's an object of experience. It, it, it's not different than, than this being an object of experience. <laughs> that body suit that has your name and history and all the important details, it's just an object of experience. Now, not that it's not an awesome object of experience. I, there's many awesome objects <laughs> of experience. And, and taken into that context, God has this multifaceted 8 billion and gazillions of bugs and, and plants. That's awesome. And it's all objects of experience, just like this bodysuit. I think that's a pretty cool idea. You're not this body. You're just, you're an appearance. The bodysuit with your name and history is just an appearance in awareness. That's your true state. Yeah. Yeah. Because what is there to the experience of a body other than this flow of sensations and feelings and the thoughts that come and go about it? All, all of which we realized prior to looking at the body exists obviously within awareness. Amazing. So let's let's pause right there for just a minute. We're about halfway through, and there was a statement at twelve oh six from Jeremy that says, "I cannot find the happiness." So, Jeremy, do you do you have your camera on? You want to come on the screen for a minute? Yes. Sir. Hey, Jeremy. How you doing? Hi. Good. Good. Good to uh, see you. Thanks for turning the camera yeah. on. Um, just a question uh, for you is um, where? What is it that is aware of? the idea or the thought that you cannot find happiness. I think what it is in my mind. You, you think that awareness is in your mind? The idea, but I can't find uh, happiness. 
Oh, okay. Okay. That's, uh, that's, that's good. So um, when you, you are, um, w when you're making a statement like that, what, what sees that thought? That's good. You 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 can't you can't put you you can't find it. You, you can't find you can't find an object to answer the question because awareness cannot be objectified. Did you see that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What what Jeremy? And um, I think that when we for this here and when the pain when the pain is created. I, I missed I missed what you said. I you you got Yeah. Uh, am I clear now? I know my internet is not so Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, so I like I just when, yeah. I just want to suggest, Jeremy, that you be gentle on yourself and uh, keep stay in the in the in the study of of the book and be aware that there the, the, the thing that is seeking happiness is is Jeremy or is the mind. And there's something that's aware of that, that you just alluded to, you just found it, the, the something that's aware of that experience, and that is your, your true self. The awareness of the experience, once it's understood, and if you're gentle on yourself and, and keep tracking with Rupert's teaching, you will find that the you that is the happiness is the thing that sees and has no judgment. It has no uh, objective experience. It's not Jeremy, the bodysuit. It's, it's, it's what is aware of the activity of Jeremy, what, like a movie, the Jeremy movie. You are the awareness of that experience, and you will find that that understanding is the happiness that you seek. And from that understanding, things change. Things change, everything changes from that understanding. So just be gentle on yourself and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Also, Jeremy, I wanna to suggest to you, Rupert is gonna be with us next week. If you have a question for Rupert, I'm sure he'll do a better, much, I know he'll do a much better job uh, in, in answering your question than I did. Uh, and he has a, uh, a full weekend retreat coming up on July 15th. And I'm going to ask Susan to put a link to that in the chat. So anyone that wants to have a bonus weekend with Rupert on You Are the Happiness You Seek, it's coming up next weekend for a full weekend, you'll get the, the benefit of Rupert giving direct teaching of this content. I think if you're interested in these ideas and the understanding of true happiness for the rest of your life, you would, you would be at that retreat. I'll be there just simply because I love his teaching, but I want to recommend to you that you, uh, you show up next week and Rupert will be with us live. And also for his retreat the following weekend, it's going to be awesome. I suggest that you go there and it'll change your life. Thanks for coming on the screen, Jeremy. Thank you very much. All right, man. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you for uh, sharing that too, Jeremy. That was, that was really great. Um, 
Amy gave an explanation here. Jeremy Francis Lucille said, and I find this helpful, that trying to find happiness is a form of resistance. The point is to allow all things to arise. What passes as happiness for most is an objective quality, just as sadness is. It comes and goes. But we, happiness, arises naturally when we understand that we need not seek for it, but let it come and go, knowing all the while that I am the eternal, infinite presence in which all arises. Beautifully stated. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that. And um, there's other comments that you can read. Uh, just go ahead and, and take a look if that's uh, if you want to follow up on some of that. And uh, Joel, where are we? We're on page uh, 67? Uh, we're still on 67, yes. Okay. What else do you see on page 67 that we want to highlight? Okay, so in the... Um... In the second paragraph, um, the, the last part, or starting from the middle. So as a concession to the mind, to enable it to think about or imagine awareness, we add a space-like quality, visualizing it as a vast empty field or space within which the entire content of experience appears. All that is required now is to remove space from this image of an aware physical space. And what remains is dimensionless awareness. And, and I love this because he's saying we discard, we even have to discard at some point the concession that we made because the concession itself is not the actual experience. It's, it's sort of like um, envision like a, the stage of a rocket, you know, it, it thrusts us into um, orbit. And then when it's no longer needed, the, the stage falls off. And we're more in the orbit of the actual understanding or closer to it. Right. Uh, right. So, so anything, anything that can be defined as a finite space and really anything that can be defined with words, because every word, the function of them is just to create a finite something that we understand. And any definition thereof is not completely it. So he's, he's pushing the boundaries of even um, space, which which implies some sort of limit to it, to that which there really isn't a noun for um, a, a limitless type of space. Yeah, yeah. And it, I like that, uh, that the idea that, um, that he presents because uh, if you take uh, the idea of, uh, of, the empt of the open empty space, and you just consider the furniture in your room that you're in. Now remove all the furniture out of the room. The, the open empty space is still the same. Mm -hmm. And now take the roof off the building that you're in and the walls, remove the walls. The open empty space is not changed. Yeah. And and extend that out into the universe and the universes of universes, and it's still the same open, empty, vast space. Yeah. And where we even defined a wall to that universe, the, the wall of that universe would be existing in an even greater empty space. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> This is um, in that next uh, paragraph, Rupert says, I vividly remember the first time this became clear to me. Francis had often spoken of awareness as the space within which all experience arises. And although I had an intuitive understanding of this, I had never realized it in my own experience. And, and then he describes his experience in California and Rupert uh, giving him this training that he, he's mentioned this, this story in a couple of, of previous books that we've looked at. He, he never goes into, in those other stories, in the other books, he doesn't go into his awakening experience as, as uh clear and as detailed as he does 
in a couple of pages from now on page 69, he talks about his big glimpse, his big revelation experience. But this, this is, this is really refreshing to me that where he brings us to the early teaching of his teacher, Francis Lucille, and, and he, he describes to us those, those first glimpses that, that Francis led him through. And now we have Rupert's book, or you have Francis Lucille's, uh, he has a couple of books out, but you have, you have Rupert's book that leads us to that same descriptive understanding that Rupert had himself not that long ago. What else would you share on page 67, Joel? Um, that, that was sort of the same, just a general sense of how, how powerful sometimes a, a personal walking through of the realization can be and to see it go from the, the blending of this microscopic realization into the, the macrocosm and, and just, and just getting a, a detailed ex explanation of the whole thing is it's just very powerful i don't really have anything to add to that yeah yeah and on page 68 if we go to the first paragraph um uh, i i really i really like uh, rupert is giving us his his personal references for for his awakening and i think this is very powerful and and can be helpful to all of us uh, Rupert's the one that helped me to see that that I was the one that I was always looking for. He helped me to see how how common awareness is for everyone, and that that is the thing that that Jesus was actually pointing to when he was talking about the kingdom of heaven. Mm. He says it became clear that the thought conceptualized. This is when he did this practice that Francis walked him through of, and he, and he felt the carpet. He felt this. He, he used the practice of, of, of noticing that awareness, uh, everything arises in awareness, all the thoughts, all the feelings, all the emotions, every thought that's held, no matter what it is, whether it's, uh, whether it's a, a thought of uh, that's negative or a thought that's positive, it's something that you would never say to anyone. You're embarrassed to think it. It's just a thought. It's a thought that rises. And, and when you don't touch it, when you, when, you under, when you learn this understanding and you don't touch it, you don't give it your identity and it just it vanishes into the nothingness that it rises from and uh rupert says it became clear that thought conceptualized the sound of the dog in that situation in the distance but all i actually knew of this sound was the experience of hearing and hearing was taking place here within myself that is, within awareness. There was no distance between my self-awareness and the experience of hearing. And if we take that back to uh, Jeremy's situation of happiness, there is no place where, uh, where uh, the thought that, that I'm, I'm not happy is just a thought. And it's seen and... It, and then it, and then it drifts away and it's it's not there and then he he's doing something else and he's doing something else and he's doing something else but the awareness of the experience is unchanged everything happens from within that awareness yes yes i i, I too have this paragraph highlighted too um because it um it brought home to me once again that he 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 has uses the phrase the sound of a dog in the distance. But imagine any 
distant sound, like at the farthest aircraft on an otherwise quiet day and the gurgling of your own stomach. And, and while thought will apply qualities to those different sounds that say they're in different places and, and there's a vast um, distance between them, they're both known in the exact same place where the knowing of hearing appears. And, and that relative to sound, the entirety of your experience comes down to the knowing of hearing. And Rupert clarifies, there's no distance between myself, awareness, and the experience or knowing of hearing. So there's a single, singular, undivided um, wholeness to every sound heard, no matter the distance, the facility of hearing, and myself that knows the facility of hearing. That alone is something you could use to extrapolate to all of your other sensory inputs and recognize there is no separation. We live in a singular world, only divided into this, as Rupert often says, a multiplicity and diversity of things by a thought. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's really also uh, very satisfying to hear Rupert's words yeah. when, when he was just taking on this understanding with, um, with Francis Lucille. And, and he says in this next paragraph on page 68, he said, until then, I had believed and felt that awareness was located somewhere behind my eyes. <laughs> Sound familiar, anyone? <laughs> Looking out at, at the world, but now I was experiencing the body and the world within myself. It was obvious that awareness perceived the world through the body, but I had mistakenly presumed that this implied that it was located in and limited to the body. Mm. The awareness with which the character in the dream perceives the world is not located in her body or indeed anywhere in the world which she perceives. It is within the limits of the analogy located in the dreamer's mind could the same be true of our experience in the waking state? I looked for a limit or an edge to the field of awareness within which my current experience was appearing, just as I used to lie awake in bed as a child, wondering how far physical space extended. However, the further I went, the more the edge or limit of awareness eluded me. Like a scientist performing experiments to test the validity of a theory, I wanted to subject the possibility that awareness might be unlimited to the scrutiny of experience. Could I find or even imagine an experience that could take place outside awareness? You know, Bill, it strikes me that if you take this portion that you just read and, and maybe even backed up two sentences before where he, he says, the focus of my interest shifted from the sensation of my hands on the floor to the sound of the barking dog to the space of awareness itself. Awareness was turning its attention upon itself. If you highlighted from there through what you just read, it, for any, any reader or anybody who's on here, if you wanted to have the time when you were on a call with somebody and you wanted to say, gee, I would like to explore some self-inquiry. How would I actually do that? This is a, a beautiful, perfect roadmap for doing that. Yeah. 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 Thank you for, for highlighting that, Joel. I, I totally agree. And, <laughs> you know, just like Rupert walks us through his own experience, he, he also is walking us through uh, something that we can, we can 
we can follow what he did. His breadcrumbs are, are good breadcrumbs. They're good for everyone. And, and these, these ideas, you can test them out for yourself. Just as uh, Joel suggested, uh, just find a quiet hour. Give yourself the gift of this clear path, clear path of knowing the self, this clear path of, 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 of connecting with that which you always are. Uh, are there any uh, questions, this understanding of living in ease from Catherine? Uh, at 1249, according to the laws of cause and effect, I can continue living as a human being liberated of the suffering and pain without the uncomfortable feeling. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Catherine. So true. This is the gift that this uh, content, that, this, that these ideas bring. It brings us to a whole a, a, a different experience in these body suits just simply because we are no longer attached to the beliefs to the suffering we're no longer attached to the to the labels that that perception and uh, what we thought we were gave to these experiences. And so we're no longer su uh, linked to the lingering and chronic suffering that they suggest. Well, let's look at page 69, Joel. What, what would you like to highlight on this beautiful description that uh, Rupert calls the all-encompassing awareness? Yeah, well, I... I highlighted the first two paragraphs as I awareness sank more and more deeply into my being. I felt that I was disentangling myself from thoughts, images, feelings, sensations, and perceptions. And as I did so, I felt myself expanding. I was no longer located in the head or chest. I was the vast, open, aware space in which everything was appearing both frightening and exhilarating. Frightening because my habitual experience of being a finite self located in and limited to the body was rapidly dissolving and exhilarating because I could not help but notice in spite of the fear, the freedom and, and joy that accompanied that rec this recognition. This so vividly describes via a personal anecdote a universal message that we can take from this. And, and th there's this other quote of Rupert's that I, I have close to me and I like to read it over and over again before I, I participate in groups with people or just sometimes just to re um, affirm for myself why it is that I'm on this exploration. Ru Rupert says that the discovery that peace happiness and love are ever present within our own being and completely available at every moment of experience under all conditions is the most important discovery that anyone can make. And I think that this, this last section of the chapter just supports it with a um, solid foundation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, this sentence right under his big glimpse that, that says uh, in, the, in the second paragraph, uh, it's, it's, it's the very last sentence in the second paragraph. He says, I began to feel what I had often read about in the traditional literature, but had never been able to verify for myself. Namely, that awareness extends beyond the limits of the body and the finite mind within which it seems to be housed and encompasses the entire universe. Um, you know, 
it's it's not very often that you find uh, uh, an awakened uh, a sage of uh, of our time, even even uh, great sages like Yogananda, Ramana, uh, Osho. You you don't hear specific experiences so uh, so clearly spelled out as you do in this one sentence from Rupert. It's just super intimate, super vulnerable. And uh, I just love, I love hearing how, how normal he is and accessible. What he's pointing to is for everyone. Yeah. The, that, that last thing you said, the, the normalness and the accessibility is not only the form, it's the message too. And then um, I think we have, this is, uh, yeah, are we on our last page? Yeah, we're on the last page on 69. What else yeah. would you share on page 69, Joel? Well, I just, I just highlighted the, the very last sentence because it's a, it, it's a recap of all of it. And it's a recap of the suggestion to remove the concession of space, he says. As a concession to the mind, it is legitimate to conceptual, conceptualize awareness as an open, empty space. But in the absence of any need to do so, the mind falls silent and there's just the awareness of being whose nature is unfathomable peace. And gosh, I don't have any words I could say after that. Yeah, I, I like that too, uh, where he describes that, that the mind falls silent. You know, the, the mind just has no place to go. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's fully surrendered to the understanding, and there's no longer a resistance from the activity that arises out of awareness that we call the mind. Yeah. It was never a stable structure to begin with. It was just a, a, a current cluster of thoughts. Yeah. A Andrew has a question at 1251. Why is multiplicity of things a thought? I am having reconciling duality with non-dual awareness. Andrew, do you want to come on the screen and, uh, and sort of uh, respond to that uh, question or to, uh, I would say that the, the question is, why is multiplicity of things a thought? So, Andrew, what are you calling multiplicity? What, what would you, what would you describe or define multiplicity? Or th there you are. Hi, Andrew. Can you unmute your mic? Yeah. So uh, Joe just said um, multiplicity of things is just a thought. And for me, the multiplicity of things uh, is like relationship, duality, subject, object. And the non-dual awareness is like the empty aware space where we have the objects. So we have this multiplicity of objects in, in the aware space. And the two are there, and it's hard to say that it's only one awareness going on, uh, just one awareness. The objects are there, 
And so do we shift from the object to awareness and then sometimes shift back to awareness? So we, we are in real life experience, suffering, pain, and that makes us shift to objects, the body, but then we can shift to awareness where we can get the peace. So I see the I see this uh, conflict going on. Joel, do you want to answer that? Um, I'll I'll take a whack at it. <laughs> um, and just to clarify, it, forgive me if I wasn't clear that um, I didn't say that. The multiplicity was just a thought. I, I don't think I expressed it like that. I'm saying it, it's the the function of thought that seems to divide the all of everything into various separate things in form. But every everything as this chapter points out, all of these various forms are known to us through perceiving. We can see and hear things. Uh, we can sense things, all the various sensory inputs of the body. And we can think and we can conceptualize, we can opine, we could believe things about them. We could question things about them. And every element of all of that is appearing within a singular awareness itself. Any possible concept we could have about any of that itself is a thought or collection of thoughts known by that um, endless field, limitless field that's being described in this chapter within, within which every possible thought about it can take place. Your, your attention that goes to a question that seems like a puzzle or your attention that goes to the passing of a bird in the sky doesn't ever leave the single space. Again, not, not the accurate word, doesn't leave the single field of awareness to go from from any one element of your experience to another. But, but it's this faculty of thought that seems to divide the world into distinctive separate things with borders around them that are disconnected from one another. What, what do you think about what uh, Krishnamurti said about the subject and the object uh, will merge if you observe, if you are aware without the uh, observer, then the duality will be gone and you have a single field of uh, awareness. Well, just between you and me, this is the first time I'm hearing that quote, but I, but I like it. It rings true to me. I, but I don't I don't know that I could expound upon it if that's what you're asking. Yeah, it sounds yeah. it sounds right to me. It's uh, I, I mean, it, this is this, essentially this, the same uh, understanding awareness when you when you say why is a multiplicity of things a thought or why are objects uh, of experience the relationships uh, body mind body suit experiences emotions feelings past present future why are all those things a they're they're all you could say a multiplicity of things and and you can you can tell that they're they're a uh, duality because they come and they go. They're temporary. They're time and space based. Anything that's time and space based is not essential 
to eternal presence, I amness, awareness. Awareness is, is not objective. It can't be objectified. It's just is. Just like the isness of God, awareness is the isness of God. And um, as, as I think your quote from Krishnamurti alludes to, uh, even duality arises in that singularity, and then it, it, it dissolves into the nothingness, and the singularity remains. Awareness is. You know, one big aha moment that I, I think I'm even having right now is we're discussing this. The moment you say a multiplicity of things, you, you have now made a, an enormous number of things into a single thing. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. That's a good one, Joel. All right, Andrew, thanks, Andrew. Thank you for your question. That was awesome, man. Appreciate it. And Susan, thank you for sharing that uh, Rupert quote uh, on the board. Uh, someone asked if you would be able to do that. That was awesome. How do we contact Joel? Uh, Joel, would you put your email address in there so that uh, people that want to join you for your Sure. Morning experiment uh, could do that. That would be awesome. Right. And if you lose track of it, just go to my name.com, joeldrasner.com. Joeldrasner.com. That's easy enough. Any other questions from anyone before we, we go? And be sure and, and uh, show up next week for Rupert. He'll be live for us. He's going to be here from 12 o'clock to 1.15. So he's going to give us 75 minutes. And uh, again, I, I recommend to everyone that's interested in this, these ideas and anyone that's interested in really the, the immersion in the, the content of this to uh, join us for the, the You Are the Happiness You Seek retreat next weekend, beginning July 15th. That's Friday, Saturday, Friday evening, Saturday and Sunday. And um, Melissa, you posted something that uh, about an interview that Rupert did in a podcast. Do you have a link for that that you can share with us? I've posted the link on the board already, Bill. You did. Okay, thanks for that. Great. All right. Well, uh, if there's any other questions, we're, we'll stay for a few more minutes. Otherwise, uh, anything else you have, Joel? Um, just... Uh... Just what a pleasure and honor it is to be here with you all. Thank you. Happy to stay if there's any more questions. Thank you. Yeah, the, the pleasure is ours. And we'll, we're going we're gonna to pause on Chapter 9 until uh, week after next, because uh, next week, of course, we'll have, we'll have Rupert with us. And then uh, we'll rejoin the following week with Chapter 9, Peace and Happiness is our nature. Looking forward to seeing everyone next week. Thanks a lot. Love you all. Bye-bye, everyone. Have an awesome week.